Welcome to Supply Chain Now, the voice of global supply chain. Supply Chain Now focuses on the best in the business for our worldwide audience, the people, the technologies, the best practices, and today's critical issues, the challenges and opportunities. Stay tuned to hear from those making global business happen right here on Supply Chain Now. Hey, good morning, everybody. Scott Luton with you here on Supply Chain Now. Welcome to today's show. We have an outstanding episode teed up once again as I'm going to be speaking with a senior supply chain leader doing big things in the warehousing, transportation, and trade compliance space. She's also what I would call a friend of the show, certainly a a professional friend of mine, and I'm really tickled to be able to sit down and interview her for the first time here on Supply Chain Now. So with no further ado, I want to welcome in Marie Hurst, Vice President of Operations and Logistics with Bunzel Retail Services, which is a division of Bunzel Distribution North America. Marie, how you doing? I'm great. Thanks for having me today, Scott. You bet. We were talking, you know, we shared a phone call as we got connected by a mutual friend that we both think highly of. Uh, mm-hmm. a, a, a few years ago, Marty Parker is doing some big things at, at uh, UGA and their supply chain program. But it's the first time we've, we've, we've had you here on the show, and I can't wait to dive into your journey and your insights and expertise. Great. I'm looking forward to it. So we're not going to waste any time. Uh, but before we get into the heavy lifting, at least, let's get to know sure. you a little bit better, Marie. So, hey, tell us, where did you grow up and, and give us a few anecdotes about your upbringing? Okay. Uh, so I'm originally from Western Massachusetts. So um, whenever I say to somebody I'm from Massachusetts, they say, but you don't have an accent. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, no, guys, there's Boston <laughs> and then there's Western, like the rest of Massachusetts. So I grew up there, um, the oldest of three girls. And then I today have three girls. So not that that means anything, but it, right. Yeah. Um, so when I was a kid, my, you know, my parents were working class folks and, you know, my mom took jobs. Like she was the bus monitor. She was the lunch lady and all that. Um, my dad actually worked for mobile chemical in plastics. So more of a manufacturing type job. He was a line worker. Um, and I had the benefit of being able to go to UGA. Oh, did you? Okay. Marie. No, I'm sorry. Did you mass? My oh. bad. <laughs> I <was> like, <laughs> you, whoa. I'm uncovering new things about no. you. I didn't know. <laughs> I've been so in Georgia UMass. so long. Yeah. You mess. I've been in Georgia so long. Everything's about <laughs> Georgia. Go dogs. <laughs> so, you know, your accent. And, and, and now I'm reminded now after we spoke years ago, it is very neutral, very neutral. Um, mm-hmm. Our dear friend Kelly Barner here at Supply Chain Now is from the Boston area. Um, um, I want to say Strawberry Hill. It's not Strawberry Hill. Uh, Shrewberry Hill, maybe. Does that sound familiar? Uh, Shrewsbury? No, I'm, I'm getting it wrong. Anyway, her accent is much more like that Boston accent. Mm-hmm. But I've got to ask you, before, before we talk about maybe uh, your time here in Georgia. So your parents and your dad being uh, on the front line, it sounds like, of a manufacturing yep. plant. Uh, did y'all have any any uh, times where you sat down, maybe he took you to the plant or, or he shared what he did day in and day out? Yeah, I mean, we. so he worked there and then my one of my uncles actually worked there as well. And we had the chance to go in a couple of times. Now we were kids, so you didn't get to really walk the floor but you got to see, you know, from the side what was happening. Um, and you realize the culture in that type of business with the, you know, 24 seven execution. Mm-hmm. And he did rotating shifts back in the day. So I remember you better be quiet when dad worked <laughs> third, because he's home sleeping during the day. And if you wake him up, there's going to be hell to pay. <laughs> so uh, you know, I remember uh, a couple of friends of mine when I, and for some reason, in kindergarten or first grade, and I would go over to their ho- uh, houses after school, and we get a little bit loud. And to your point, you better not wake up, um, wake dad or mom up working at work's third shift. So yeah. uh, those are some tough gigs. Yep. Now your mom, it sounds like she was very active in your academic journey, always volunteering. A, uh, a bus. What was her? Bus, she did the bus monitor. And she did lunch lady duties. Um, And then when my little sister, I have a little sister who's 12 years younger. When my little sister came along, my mom actually converted and started doing daycare. 
Man. Okay. So, yeah. Whatever it sounds like, whatever she could do to to kind of keep an eye on her three daughters. Yep. Is that right? Yep. Pretty much. Now, <laughs> so, <laughs> so many questions, so little time. But let, <laughs> well, let's talk about, um, so what brought you to Georgia? I want to talk about your time in retail supply chain yeah. in a minute, but, but you've been in Georgia, as you mentioned a little while ago, for quite some time. I uh, where did you, when did you first move to Georgia? So I was working for a retail division called Filene's that, that got bought out. It was part of the May department stores, which were out of St. Louis and got purchased by Federated, which is Macy's. Um, so I was in Connecticut and had, it was, I was actually running the transportation department for the regional department store Filene's. And the scenario was, Hey, their central office is in Atlanta. You can take a severance or you can take a promotion. <laughs> wow. Options, options, huh? Yeah. So that was a tough conversation with my husband. He was, um, he does TV news. He's a cameraman that goes around with the reporter. Really? Um, and he loves his job, but I, we always looked at it as, you know, what's the career path and what he wants to do, what he loves to do. He would say you can't do it anywhere, but you could you could pretty much do it anywhere. I mean, it's it's a very solid transferable skill set. Um, thank goodness he didn't go to CNN, right? Because that has changed so much over the years. He's That's actually right. with one of the local Atlanta stations. That so, is so cool. Yeah. So we transferred. He was able to transfer and you know keep the same length of service and vacation and everything. So it worked out well. He's still he gave me a hard time for a couple of years about, about moving to Atlanta and the <laughs> difference between living in at the time we were in Northern Connecticut and then dealing with the population here in Atlanta. Right. So, <laughs> Well, that and probably uh, the weather differences are, are probably pretty big too. At least he doesn't have to worry about snow here as he's capturing that, that perfect shot. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Th- that's, it's funny. It's like you've been at the dinner table because I'll say, oh, I love Atlanta. Atlanta weather is great. There's no snow. And he'll say, yeah, you don't have to stand outside when it's 95 degrees. That, oh, well, that and, and trade-offs, I guess, trade-offs. Well, that's fascinating. Uh, I've never had a chance to meet someone in uh, in like that, other than um, some producers that weren't the camera technicians. I mean, we'll have to sit down and, and uh, have a chat with your husband, but um so as you mentioned, you mentioned Macy's, you mentioned, um, was it Philem? What was the other? Uh, Filene's. Yes, Filene's. Filene's. Mm-hmm. Uh, you spent a good bit of time within that Macy's organization. That's where you were when we first met. Yep. Um, for our listeners mm-hmm. that may not have spent time in retail supply chain, I'll call it. What, what's one thing that might surprise people? So um, I actually, I was thinking about that. And there's a couple of things that that come to mind for me. So first thing I would say is, there are a lot of um, complete competing priorities. So often they're conceptually counterintuitive to each other. So as an example, a lot of the product is planned and committed six months to a year ahead of, of actual delivery to the store because it's, you know, you have to produce it. You have to get the, the raw materials. You have to make it in some other country. Often you have to plan that transit you have to get it if you were going to do any kind of value-added services and then get it to the store. Well, so a lot of that tends to be flowing year over year. It'll flow by the same or similar calendar. But then at the same time, the merchants are always trying to be attentive to trends and hot product, which means you may suddenly get a request to move multiple containers or truckloads of something from a place you've never covered before. And it's got to happen right away because some other retailers trying to get their hands on that same product and there's X amount. So it, it's really, I think it can be, it's a combination of we, this is what we do and, oh my God, we got to go do this. <laughs> you know, it's, it's interesting. I'm hearing a couple things there. Uh, and my, all my retail experience was not in supply chain uh, mm-hmm. back as I was coming through uh, college and well, high school and college. Uh, is it was where I got the most of my retail experience, but the sequencing that you're describing, because it's, you got to plan so far out because of all yeah. the different things and the different suppliers. But also what's interesting, I've never really thought about, and it makes perfect sense, is the competition. There's all, you know, there's tons of competition to retail, 
but the retail supply chains are competing long before it even mm-hmm. hits the stores. That, that's really something that I bet of a lot of our listeners hadn't stopped to think about yet. Yeah, it's fascinating, yeah. Marie. Yeah, thanks. And then the other thing that I was thinking about, I felt was worth raising is, you know, returns and reverse logistics are a big piece of retail and have always been, even prior to how we've seen so much growth with online shopping over the past several years. I mean, retailers generally try to have a return agreement with the vendors up front as part of the purchase order and the agreements that they have with those vendors, but they can't always negotiate that. So often after you see something on a clearance rack, it's been marked down two or three times that will have to go back to logistics to deal with. Right. Generally you're trying to liquidate it. Some of it will end up in an off price store in the U S or shipped overseas you really don't want to throw it in a dumpster. You want to find some end of life reuse wherever possible. Yes. And, you know, to that point, uh, there's a ton of innovation taking place in what uh, Tony Shirota with the uh, Reverse Logistics Association, uh, one of our dear friends and and, Mm -hmm. and content partners, he's called uh, the dark side of supply chain because it doesn't get as much visibility. Uh, The great news there, though, the good news is is that aspect because of e-commerce and because of of uh, consumers demanding more sustainable solutions. We're seeing a lot of innovation on that reverse side. Is that, you, will you see that as well? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Especially things that are, you know, it's a customer return and it's resaleable, right? Right. Because y- you can build some of that into your, your mega center logic where you can put it in a, a location that's close to where you're going to ship again and not put it back with its brothers in the original location right? because you know it's going to turn. And why put it away if I'm going to be able to ship it again? Well, and, and the whole re-economy. Uh, right. Gosh, I've seen all kinds of projections in terms of market size. And that's a great thing. You know, we, um, I've shared this with our listeners before. Last uh, holiday season, I got my kids a, um, a um, remanufactured Nintendo Wii. And of course, they don't make those anymore. It was probably, I don't know, 12 years old. And they loved it. Yeah, and that, that's a really cool, uh, cool dynamic taking place. Uh, I bet you could talk retail supply chain till the cow, the proverbial cows came home, and then there's so much there. But I want to get into uh, Marie, and let's. But is it okay to move to what you're up to now? Sure, absolutely. So uh, I have been way back when I first came to Atlanta. Uh, I did a little bit of business with Bunzel, and I think it was okay. out on the um, the west side of Metro Atlanta. And I've been in a couple of the facilities um, there. But tell Lithia us. Lithia Springs? I think so. Yeah. I think uh-huh. so, Maria. And that was that was three kids ago. And my three kids have killed my memory. Uh, but yep. I'm pretty sure Lithia Springs. Um, yep. So, but l- level setting with our listeners. Tell us about Bunzel Retail Services and what the organization does. Yeah, sure. So, so Bunzel Globe. And then I'm going to say globally because we do have presence in other countries as well. The Lithia Springs building is part of another division. Bunzel does a lot of distribution for a lot of different markets. So there are divisions that manage grocery supplies. There are divisions that manage case goods only for some of the retailers. Um, We do our own fleet in a lot of those divisions. So we're doing our own deliveries from our local warehouse and we're doing a run like every Thursday, they do the run down to Savannah or whatever, as example, and they build out their routes like that. Bunzel Retail Services is a little bit different in that we're doing a lot more of the, the smaller or niche or value-added services type services for our retail uh, partners. Um, so most of what we're doing is distribution. So about 90% of what we're doing is just the actual distribution of you want a case of bags, you want a vest for your employee, you want a pack of pens and a couple of batteries. Um, We also have a subdivision within retail services that does designs packaging and visual displays. Um, And then we have material consolidation. So that would be... An example would be if you have a news store and you don't want to just spam that location with all the supplies from the different display companies and and, um, cleaning supplies and so forth, we can actually do a service where we will consolidate it all, build out pallets, and then release it to you in time for your setup for your opening. 
Okay. A, a lot, you make it sound so easy and we all know it is not easy, is it, Marie? No, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> well, so let's let's focus in on more, on more of your role. So uh, VP Operations and Logistics, yep. uh, tell us where do you spend and what, do you, you know, what makes up your uh, day-to-day, I'll call it, even though I'm sure each day is different. And what is your favorite aspect to your role? Mm-hmm. So um, I spend... I spend about half my time on the road because I have uh, about eight different locations around the country that I'm attentive to more than some of the others. Um, The bigger ones or the ones undergoing change would be probably the the most important for my time on the road. But then we've also got some locations overseas that we service uh, through 3PLs. Um, And I have a local transportation group in Chicago that manages that in partnership with a corporate group in St. Louis. Um, And then I have a couple of engineers that are working with me because we're trying to do a lot of work on continuous improvement and growing our facilities to be more efficient. Uh, I think everybody has noticed that there's a lot of challenges with labor and the cost of labor continues to go up. Um, So we're trying to be really thoughtful and methodical about the way we lay out the buildings where we can put in um, sorters. We're looking at pick carts. I think you're doing something with Six Rivers. We're actually yeah. talking to Six Rivers um, to see you know, whether we can do a pilot with them for some of our pick pack areas and a couple of our buildings. Um, it, it, it's really, it's, you know, distribution is down and dirty, but how can you make it more effective and efficient? And I think what's interesting to me with non-retail is, you're trying to do things and your margins, you got to be really thoughtful about your margins because you're, you're not, you don't have the markup that you have on retail to cover some of your sins. So you just, you got to be, you got to execute. <laughs> got to execute. That's right. No willy nilly allowed. Right. Um, uh, so speaking of, I, I love your emphasis on the team member and the colleagues and the employees at, at EX at employee experiences is, is I think, one of the silver linings of what we've seen and all gone through in the last couple of years. And I think I saw on social as I was doing my homework on you, uh, Marie Hurst, I promise I wasn't lurking uh, <laughs> to try to do a little homework is, uh, you know, emphasis on safety and, and mm-hmm. making sure we're taking care. I love that that has come back to the forefront in, 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 um, in recent years. So it sounds like that's a big part of the culture too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, That's one of the things that I really enjoy with this organization is there's a very robust safety culture. And what you're referring to is we did the Caterpillar safety training module, which was great. I brought my team members from around the country and we sat for a few days, went through that training with the Caterpillar people, and then had some of our own operational discussions about what are our best practices, what are our standards, et cetera. And, you know, for me, it's not about having a safety moment, which is a catchphrase these days. It's what's your safety momentum. I love that. Uh, I got an 86 safety moment and make it about the momentum and the bigger picture and, and uh, what really stays front of mind, which will, which I'm assuming, and, and, and I'll defer to you, but, how can we prevent situations from even happening that then we got to react to make sure folks are, are safe? So right. um, I love that emphasis uh, on, on, on taking care of the team. Um, what else do you love about your role? And then I want to talk a little more about your culture. Okay. Um, what I love about my role is that I have some really strong team members with me. Um, we are vocal and open and we, you know, bring things to the surface. Uh, it's not a political, I try not to lead a political sphere, right? I don't want you to tell me what you think I want to hear. I, I want to know, wh- tell me what you're thinking. Let's talk it through. I might still be right, but I might not, right? <laughs> and let's air it out. Let's let's get the best of everybody's ideas and try and, you know, percolate the best solution. Um, I think that, the leadership team with Bunzel Retail Services does that for the most part. I mean, we all have days where we just, we def- go back to, it's easier just to agree and nod, right? But we have a lot of good, robust conversation and we're all focused on how do we continue to drive the business and service the customers. 
Um, so speaking of that culture that clearly uh, you're um, um, helping to maintain and you know, helping to lead and instill, um, what else? So I love the non-political culture. Uh, it, you know, I think a lot of us can probably relate to uh, at least one organization. I know I've, I've been in a couple that were heavily political and it's so stifling. It's so stifling to new ideas. It's stifling because you've got to kind of figure out how to navigate a minefield because of just the sheer politics. And I am so thankful uh, that that is not what we're building here at Supply Chain now by a very, um, with all deliberation, right? But what else do you love about the culture at Bunsen? So something that I found interesting when I first started working there is, you know, I came from Macy's and it, it was so big, you know, 130,000 employees, something, you know, significant um, and had been centralized across the board. Um, this is very different in that Bunzel acquires companies and there is corporate oversight, but they have kept a lot of those different divisions to themselves. So, the benefit of that is that you have a culture where you have more ability to have your voice heard or to, to be impactful because you're not going up five levels, right? I report to the division head. He reports to the North America CEO who reports to the corporate CEO in London. So it's, it's almost kind of like that, that uh, the, the, the benefits of like local ownership, um, you know, uh, and, and it also sounds like, and, and please correct me if I'm wrong, that as Bunzel has made these acquisitions, they protected the, um, you know, the individual personalities, cultures, brands, and, and um, it, you know, uh, helped empower and, and really leverage uh, that locally owned uh, leadership ownership. Is that, is that accurate? Yeah, they, they call it the entrepreneurial spirit. Okay. Hey, I love that. Yep. Uh, as as a fellow entrepreneur, I know exactly you're you're yep. speaking my language. Yep. Um, so let's shift gears a bit. So okay. I want to shift from Bunzel because I know there's a lot more. We're just scratching the surface with with what you and and the, and Bunzel and its various divisions do day in and day out. But I want to talk kind of you as um as as uh, your leadership style. And I think one of the things that as I was doing my homework seems to be really important to you is, is volunteering and that, and that service. Mm -hmm. um, so you volunteered your time at a variety of charitable initiatives, uh, Central Night Shelter, mm -hmm. Year Up, mm -hmm. uh, and some others. What's been your favorite or one of your favorite volunteer experiences and what's, what's your why? So, I mean, I like them all for different reasons. I think that the night shelter really resonated with me the most. It's the men's night shelter in Atlanta. Um, I think that a lot of times when people think about night shelters, they're thinking about women and children, which is extremely important. Um, we don't necessarily think about the men. And so that central night shelter takes care of that subgroup that doesn't always get because for righteous reasons, doesn't always get included in the main shelters. Um, I supported it initially. It was part of the church group activities and I fell into it because it hits me on a couple of levels. It hits me because I grew up and we didn't have a lot. So I understand what that's like to, to mm -hmm. be trying to decide where to put your dime. Right. Um, that's, that's important to me. Um, and then the other thing that, it really helps me with is a lot of those guys are hardworking. They're trying to do right by themselves and they just, they're stuck in a situation where they, they can't afford a house or they can't, you know, they have to make choices. They, they some of them are working. They just don't have a living wage. Some of them have other situations and they're, that's why they're there. That's why they're homeless. But I feel like it helps you personalize and not just broad brush, right? Because I think a lot of times in life, we just say that bucket is X. Mm. And to me, being on the front line with those types of situations helps you differentiate and be compassionate. And it helps you, you know, reflect on yourself and, and how you are as a person. Yeah, I love that. Uh, you know, if I think about uh, the cultures uh, and the leaders that I would want to work for, uh, and I think back through some of the, my favorite folks I've ever worked with or before, that entrepreneurial spirit, 
spirit, which you uh, referenced earlier, but that compa- that really authentic, compassionate leadership that folks that can really um, empathy is a is a true um, a skill set, right? Right. Um, so I love that, and and it it crystallizes your why. Um, so growing up, uh, y'all had to make some sacrifices. It sounds like Marie. Yep. Yep. Um, all right. So let's shift gears once again. Uh, so to our listeners that uh, you want to be like Marie, you want to you know uh, be successful in supply chain, move up into the senior levels of leadership. Uh, what you're already hearing, I think Marie's already shared uh, some important advice and, and tools and tips. But I want, I want to be very intentional with the question here. So folks that do want to break into supply chain, maybe they're they're still matriculating through their programs at UGA or otherwise, or UMass maybe. Yep. Um, and they want to break in with both feet and move into the senior levels. What would be your advice, Marie? Um, I would say look for any internship opportunities, look for summer jobs. Um, I would say once you get your foot in the door somewhere, try to be the one that stands out because you take things other people don't want to do. I would say that a lot of times in my career, I have been able to advance or um, take a new role or be noticed because there were five of us trying to go for, for this one role. And then we found out that this other role, four of them are like, "Eh." and I said, (laughs) I'll do it. I'll do it. And then it got to the point in my career where, because I had said, I'll do it. And I didn't always want to do it, but I learned something every time I did it um, where they started coming to me and saying, Hey, can you, we want you to come do this. Um, And that to me becoming well-rounded is critical to rising up because you have to know enough about enough to be able to supervise it all. So um, I love that. I think folks that raise their hand, you know, volunteer, blessed are the volunteers. I've heard heard, uh, it said, uh, you know, folks that are willing to take on the the projects and initiatives that that other folks don't want to touch with a 10 foot pole. Uh, I love that advice. But let me ask you kind of, let me play devil's advocate for a second. Okay. Um, uh, at the same time, finding that voice, uh, kind of going back to, hey, tell me, don't tell me what I want to hear. Mm-hmm. Tell me what what you want to share. Yep. So, so when you're volunteering and raising your hand and taking on these things other folks don't want to do, what about those moments that you've had? I'm sure you've had where you've had to kind of draw a line in the sand yep. and kind of lay out, you know, um, you know, and be heard. Right. Any, 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 any experiences come to mind there? Uh, yeah, there's definitely been a couple of times where I jumped deep into something and was like, wow, this is, this is ugly and painful. <laughs> <laughs> and you got the scars to prove it. You is got that right? the scars to prove it. And, you know, it's, I think that's interesting too, because one thing we don't tend to focus on is teaching people how to fail. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I, absolutely, and 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 I would take it a, a step further. Is it's okay, you know, and even even in a, in a um, you know, in a in um, I don't know if this makes sense, but like an, a a real execution environment, like a manufacturing plant, where you know you're not on the product development side, you might be in, in operations where failure can mean a lot worse uh, mm-hmm. consequences and right. repercussions. But still, I I completely agree with you. You know, failure. Um, Love to get your take. I think the mo- the highest performing cultures that that really are truly innovative in a w- in a real uh, action oriented manner are those that um, that tolerate and maybe even encourage failure much more than others. Would you agree with that, Marie? Yeah, I think it's I think it's critical because if I'm not allowed to fail, then I'm less likely to try. Now, the other piece I would say there though is when I fail, I need to learn from that failure. That's right. One, one, one more quick follow-up question related to um, your advice here. And we kind of talked about this in a different vein pre-show, but, but the ability to call timeout. Mm-hmm. You know, I think uh, when I think about some of my most complex projects or initiatives that either I've led or been part of, um, oftentimes, especially as a team with folks from different walks of life or they've got their own data and different spreadsheets, mm-hmm. you know, uh, some of the most valuable meetings or, or days is when we've called timeout and we've level set and we've kind of removed the fluff and, and really kind of reprioritize on what's important. Right. You know, sometimes it can be painful and it can be awkward or uncomfortable to call that timeout and be that person. Yep. 
but it is absolutely critical. Speak to that uh, a minute, if you would, Marie. Yeah, sure. So it, that actually resonates with me for something that happened this week. Um, and I won't get into that, but one of the good things that I got out of Macy's is I got trained as a Six Sigma black belt. And I think key to, to the training of being a black belt is how do you how do you document what a process is and where your defect points are and what are your priorities and how do you support that with data, not emotion, right? So a lot of times when I'm counter to somebody on how to solve something, a peer will say, um, I, I try to bring it back to, wait, hold on. <laughs> what are we actually trying to get to? Right. Because you can throw five other problems at me, but if that's not going to solve what we're really trying to accomplish here, then we're just getting ourselves off into tangents and we're not actually going to make progress. So let's stop. Let's whiteboard it. I love a whiteboard. <laughs> and, I'll, and I'll take a picture so I, you know, somebody else walks in and erases it. I've got it. <laughs> I love that. And Maria, I, I got to tell you, we, we are kindred spirits. Um, and, and where I see it spill over, because I Lean Six Sigma has been part of my journey as well. Um, where I see it spill over and where I really think it's universal is with on my customer service calls as a consumer. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, the last couple of years, our appliances got worn out. I was on more calls for more replacement parts and I, hopefully I'll ever be on the next couple of years. Yep. But just getting to, hey, what part number are we talking about? <laughs> give me some dates. You yep. know, w- give me specific data points so that we're not just all nodding our head when we really don't understand, you know, uh, where the different partners come from. So um, I'm with you. I'm it's with that. You. And then it's who's actually going to take the steps, the initiative to get some of these things done. So put names next to who's doing what yep. and dates. Right. Love it. I love it. Maria. Yeah. Uh, we may be cousins. We might've been separated <laughs> at some point. Um, okay. So I want to switch gears as we kind of come down the, the home stretch here. Yep. Um, now that we've kind of, you've given our listeners some advice for folks that want to really achieve, um, let's broaden out. Let's look at the, the global supply chain ecosystem, mm-hmm. uh, you know, kind of the current state of things. What's one or two things, items, trends, news, really whatever that you're tracking more than others right now? Yeah. So from a pain point perspective, I think the the challenges related to product shortages, item shortages, right? Because we're doing some project work and it's, you know, you're waiting for a part to come in. We're trying, we're, we did narrow aisle racking in my building in Reno and we're putting the, the magnets to stop the equipment at the end of the aisle for safety. Um, and then you're, you're waiting for the magnets because they're on back order, <laughs> right? So it's that type of stuff. Um, I still have my oven com- microwave combo died in on Thanksgiving. It was supposed to be in in January. Then it was supposed to be in in May. Now it's supposed to be in in July. It's wow. same thing as what you were talking about, like what's going on. Um, so I think that that to me is is going to be an ongoing concern. Um, then from a creativeness and fun perspective, it's really about things like what can Six River Systems do for us so that we can get some efficiencies. Um looking at some of the different options for goods to person pick modules and how might that come into play in some of our facilities and refining standard practices, like some of the back to basics. Um, I think that there's a, a, a lot, you know, we went to Modex and there was just, you're just awestruck. You don't know where to look because right. there's something cool to do everything right. With the, the automated floor washer. <laughs> that can it's like a Roomba for a warehouse, right? Like there's there's something everywhere. So it's really figuring out which of those things are going to give us the best bang and then explaining why we need the money to go do it. <laughs> I love it. It's like uh, the greatest show on earth for supply chain uh, in Modex, right? Yep. Um, so let's, um, uh, going back to your first point you made, just to kind of illustrate, you know, we're all familiar with the product delays and the longer mm-hmm. lead times. Mm-hmm. Even, I was reading the other day, Tootsie Roll. Yeah. The Tootsie Rolls, I don't think there's been an interruption in the manufacture of Tootsie Rolls in history. Right. But they are, if they didn't shut the production line, they were really close to having to do that. And that, that, that to me, that was a signal of just, you know, we all, we all read about it in headlines every day, but man, it is just everywhere. Yep. Um, all right, so uh, let's talk about Eureka moments. 
Okay. So that Tootsie Roll moment was a bit of a eureka moment for me, right? Yeah. <laughs> Even the things maybe that we take the most, uh, the things we take the most granted for, um, you know, the candy aisle, the, the convenience uh, store, mm-hmm. what have you. But what's been for you? What's been one of your stronger eureka moments here lately? Um, I think one of the things that comes to mind for me is, so we we have seen a lot of challenges with warehouse space. And I don't think there's a short-term solution. And you can go out in any of these markets, you can see that there's a lot of, they're building warehouses um, to try and accommodate the needs because we've done so much to try to pull product into the U.S. earlier and et cetera. And you've got all these retailers who had things that came late that they now have to store until the next peak season. Um, but something that that is interesting for me to watch that resonates with me personally is the push to move from plastic to paper, which is appropriate from a sustainability perspective. Right takes up a lot more space. So we have, when we have the pay, the plastic sacks, like the grocery sacks, right? you can have a thousand of those in one box. If you do paper bags, you're looking at eight times the space mm. for the mm. same number of bags. Competing priorities. Uh, yeah. I think you mentioned that on the front end. Yeah. Um, you know, that's just a great example. Um, I, I do love... Um, I, I collect. Uh, it's so funny. Um, uh, last week, I had two events, two in-person events for the first time in a very long time. And I actually came home with paper bags mm-hmm. because I got room service on a couple of occasions. And they use these sturdiest, I'm going to sound like a big nerd, Marie, but bear <laughs> with me. They use the sturdiest, <laughs> huge paper bags for like a small sandwich. Mm-hmm. And I could not, I just couldn't throw it away. And I used yeah. to work in a grocery store and and bagged plenty of things. I came home with them, you know, um, but back to, you know, those trade-offs, those competing priorities. Right. It is right. uh, it, it's such a reality, right? Uh, it seems like every hour, every day, and some decisions we've got to make as, as organizational leaders, right? Right. Right. Um, so what, um, I want to make sure folks know uh, how they can connect with you. I, uh, Murray, I've really enjoyed following you and, and interacting with you on social. So folks, Make sure you're you're connected with Marie and, and you follow her on LinkedIn. Mm-hmm. Uh, enjoy that content there. But how can folks, Marie, learn more about you and Bunzel? So I would say, to your point, um, try to connect with me on LinkedIn. And then um, Bunzel Distribution has a website. And Bunzel Services, Bunzel Retail Services, is actually launching a website this week. It's bunzelservices.com. Um, and that will actually tell potential customers about the different service levels that we offer and the different customer bases that we're targeting or already servicing. Um, there's actually a little chat bot, which is connected to a live salesperson really? during, during the day, during the week, obviously, you know, with some limitations because he has to sleep, but um, <laughs> they, they actually um, sent it internally out yesterday. Love it. Uh, I love it. Um, well, hey, uh, Maria, I'm so glad. I appreciate it. as busy as you are and the team and everything you got uh, cooking. Uh, thanks so much for taking some time out to, uh, to share your, your expertise and your, your journey with our listeners. Uh, so we'll have to have you back maybe later in the year as we're reflecting on the year that was. It continues a trend. Uh, fascinating times to be in supply chain, right? Yes, very much so. Hopefully when we talk again, I'll actually have that oven. <laughs> And you've put it to use. I love that. <laughs> yeah. uh, we've been chatting with Marie Hurst, Vice President of Operations and Logistics with Bunzel Retail Services. You can check out their new website. Of course, that's a division of Bunzel Distribution North America. Marie, always a pleasure. Thanks so much. We look forward to reconnecting soon. Great. Thanks, Scott. You bet. All right, listeners, hopefully you enjoyed uh, this uh, time with Marie as much as I have. Chock full of practical, been there, done that perspective. Uh, both in her early in the journey and what she's doing now, which I find fascinating and a a ton of advice, not just with when I asked her about advice for uh, folks that want to really achieve in supply chain, but I think the whole conversation was full of practical advice. So, uh, but hey, uh, make sure you connect with her, make sure you find supply chain now, wherever you get your podcast from and whatever you do uh, on behalf of our entire team here at supply chain. Now, Scott Luton challenging you to do good, to give forward and to be the change that's needed. And on that note, we'll see you next time right back here 
at Supply Chain Now. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for being a part of our Supply Chain Now community. Check out all of our programming at supplychainnow.com and make sure you subscribe to Supply Chain Now anywhere you listen to podcasts and follow us on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Instagram. See you next time on Supply Chain Now. Thank you.